I'm Austin Federa. I'm one of the three co-founders of the Double Zero Project. One of the really nice things about the Double Zero Project is it still feels true to all of the work that I was doing at the Sauna Foundation um, and before at Bison Trails and before sort of when working in the Ethereum space. But it's almost like an, an evolving perspective on, well, where is this, where is this outcome best driven by? And at some point that becomes not working for an L1, that be becomes working on the fundamental infrastructure governing and limiting all of blockchain systems. This is like kind of, I would say like out of vogue nowadays. Like you see all of this like work pushing towards um, like execution and software. And this is not just sort of a crypto thing, but like at its core until the AI revolution came about, most software companies were not working on low level work. And even folks like OpenAI and you know all these different like companies working on advanced AI systems, you gotta remember it is all on the back of NVIDIA for the most part, right? We, we, these systems are only made possible because of years of investment in hardware and R&D that sometimes is software related, right? The T in GPT comes from uh, a bunch of Google research from a number of years ago, but it wasn't operationalizable until we had new hardware systems that were capable of running this type of stuff. And I feel like blockchain's in a very similar place where we have a lot of interesting and good software systems. Yeah, it's kind of funny. So like back in college, back in like, you know, I graduated in 2013, like I did political science and environmental science and econ. And in retrospect, that's just a blockchain degree. And so when you look at kind of the work at whether it's like Bison Trails or Sauna Foundation or now with, with Double Zero, um, it is always trying to continue and push those principles as far as you can push them. Like the thing people usually think of as the hardest to decentralize is the closer you get to the physical world. Um, software systems and abstract systems are not easy to decentralize, but they're much easier to decentralize and to distribute because the location doesn't matter. Like if I have a validator building a block in Singapore and I'm submitting a transaction from New York, that block space is equally valuable to me. All I care about is did my transaction get included? Now, maybe I'm not going to get included because the latency time to get from New York to Singapore over the public internet is pretty high. But once my transaction gets there and if it's included, it's just as good of a resource. That's not the case when it comes to things in the physical world, right? Like. Cell phone towers have a fixed range. Fiber runs from one physical point to another physical point. And all of the hard problems on a geopolitical sense, on a technology sense, on like a national security sense, they're all bounded by physical limitations. They're not bounded by software limitations. And so for me, this feels like we've, like we've been eating closer to the core problem, which is that the internet is pretty centralized and pretty low performance. Um, and that's kind of one of the main things that like brought me to Double Zero as an idea. There are a surprising number of subsea fiber cables out there. I think people are, for one, surprised to learn the internet does not go through satellites in space, that 99.99% of the internet goes through fiber cables, especially when you're talking about moving from one continent to another. And so the way that these companies are structured is about 20 or so tier one ISPs. And this goes back to like the early founding days of the internet and, based, and how these structures were built. But you have like a tier three ISP, which might be like your local internet provider, or in some, in some cities, if you're lucky, there's a municipal services internet provider um, and it's run fiber to everyone's house. But then that rolls up to a tier two ISP, which maybe services your state or like the tri-state area in New York or something like that. And then when you're talking about global coverage, like Verizon does not have any uh, you know, last mile connections in Japan and NTT does not have any last mile connections in the United States. And so you're going through this mesh of kind of rolling up from tier three to tier two to tier one internet service providers. And there's not that many tier one service providers. There's actually fewer than there are like Nakamoto coefficient uh, validators on Solana, um, which is, really surprising, I think, when people hear about that. And what that means is, like, blockchain talks a lot about, like, World War III resistance. And they don't necessarily mean, like, a bunch of nukes flying around, but, like, some type of extreme action that forces censorship onto the traffic that we all use today. If you're in China, or if you've been to China, you know that firewalls are pretty damn good nowadays. 
And if the United States wanted to turn off all access to blockchain traffic, it could do so. It, it, is, it is a social problem, it is not a technical problem. And finding ways to bypass that, while they could exist, especially for something like Bitcoin with a very low data rate, it's functionally very hard to see something like that actually being successful in any real scale. Um, and so when we think about decentralization of the internet, we have to accept that like these are high capex, high opex operations to keep these networks up and running. And most of what keeps blockchains censorship resistant is the fact that they uh, operate on large networks that across multiple different areas. And so what we're trying to do with double zero to kind of get back to, to double zero here and, and its decentralization is we're creating alternative pathways for data to move throughout the world for high performance distributed systems. And we're doing it in such a way where there's multiple independent contributors providing bandwidth and fiber connectivity and actually running these systems. And so the minute we get to, let's say 20 independent providers, we have decentralization that matches the internet, which is wild because that's not actually that many people. You could see, you know, within two or three years of mainnet launch that double zero would have 20 global network providers. Um, and that's where things get, I think, very interesting from the perspective of being able to not just provide something that's higher quality service and much more dependable and much faster with lower latency and lower jitter than the public internet, but potentially even past the decentralization metrics of the public internet. So double zero is solving the connectivity and communication layer between validators and other types of high performance distributed systems. And to get a little bit more specific on the problem there, the internet is really good at allowing one server to talk to another server anywhere in the world. It may not be super fast, it may not be particularly high performant, it may not be very consistent, but that communication is able to go through. What the internet is not very good at is one-to-many communications. So when there's data that originates in one location and it needs to get quickly and efficiently propagated out to the rest of a network, which is exactly how a blockchain works, right? One validator at a time produces a block and then it has to send that data out to every other node in the system. Uh, the internet, you know, kind of falls over when you ask it to do things like that. And there's some really good workarounds from Solana's Turbine to Monad's Raptorcast that sort of attempt to mimic what's called multicast on a unicast network like the internet. And so double zero by being a physically interconnected network of dedicated fiber is able to use technologies that aren't available on the public internet. And multicast is one of those main technologies. Multicast allows one packet to be hardware accelerated and hardware replicated and sent everywhere it needs to go in the network. And the cool thing about multicast is it's not just one directional. There can be multiple nodes on the network sending packets out at the same time and the network will still replicate all these packets and send them, the, you know, they'll, they'll cross in the air as they fly through and actually land at all the places they're supposed to get to. And the nice part is multicast replication happens as far from the core as possible. So if you're trying to send you know, one copy of data from let's say Amsterdam to Singapore and there's a thousand recipients in Singapore, you're still only sending one packet from Amsterdam to Singapore. The network and the switching devices on the other end are actually multiplying that data once it gets to its end destination and sending it out to all the places it needs to go. And so this massively reduces the amount of bandwidth that's required to run these networks. And at the same time, it massively increases the performance of these networks because there's less data that a validator has to send out. If double zero doesn't work or you know something like it doesn't end up existing, we're kind of stuck in a world where you have two options. One is you limit the performance of blockchains like Solana to the best the public internet can do. And the public internet does get better, but it doesn't get better as quickly as you would think it gets better. Um, the fundamental traffic routing problems are not 10 times better than they were 10 years ago. They're slightly better than they were 10 years ago. But we have this sort of asymmetric demand where people are using more and more data every day as we get more and more connected devices and more and more things switch from traditional models to digital distribution. And so all of that means that the pace of new infrastructure getting built 
is pretty well matched to the pace of consumer demand. In fact, there are whole analysts working at these networking companies that are making sure that they're not building infrastructure too far ahead of where demand is because infrastructure in the absence of demand is just a cost center. And so one of the pieces that you know these companies spend a lot of money making sure is that they're not actually building too much capacity. They want to build the right amount of capacity to meet the demand of internet users, which is part of why COVID caught everyone a little bit like by surprise, because we moved a huge amount of communications technology from in-person office to remote. And if you remember, it took the internet a little while to catch up. Um, and so in a world where you don't have something like double zero, blockchains are basically limited to the performance of the internet, or we have to start sacrificing decentralization in very serious ways. And we see networks choosing to do this today, saying they're gonna have five or seven validators and they all have to be run in the same data center or in the same city. But we think that that's fundamentally a short-sighted approach or at least a regional approach. Like a global blockchain has this characteristic of being universally acceptable. And there's a reason that stock markets are local. The New York Stock Exchange is different from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is different than the London Stock Exchange, in part because these systems move so quickly and in such small geographic areas that if you're trying to trade against someone, you know, if you're located in London trying to trade against someone in New York, you're always going to lose out. You need to actually locate your servers in the same building as the person in New York in order to remain competitive. That could be a future for some types of blockchain systems that are trying to compete with like centralized exchanges directly. But for global execution environments and global settlement layers, um, we need to make sure these things are equally accessible throughout the world while also bringing higher throughput and higher scalability to them. And that's exactly what Double Zero is designed to do. So the long-term vision for Double Zero is larger than blockchain, it's larger than Solana. It is to establish a global prioritization layer for high performance data moving throughout the world. And you would think today that you can just go pay extra money on the internet and you can get your traffic prioritized, but that's actually not possible today. And so in a world where double zero is sort of maximally successful, it's created diversified pathways to reach every country in the world. And in doing so, it's bringing effectively bandwidth fee markets and uh, into every one of these locations and that way, if someone says, I'm creating a new internet business and I need to be able to access you know, fast, reliable data transport that can support my types of applications, they have alternatives other than going to the big cloud providers and you know, paying those fees and going through in that way. We're really trying to create an alternative system both for data movement, but also an entirely new uh, kind of fundamental marketplace structure where companies can build on top of this new infrastructure layer as opposed to having to build on top of the existing infrastructure layers. There's parts of the vision that sort of support global connectivity. A lot of times when people talk about global connectivity, they talk about bringing internet to people who don't have internet today. And I don't think there's a future, at least not in the foreseeable future, where double zero is available at your house the same way you can get Comcast or Verizon or something like that. Um, it's more about bringing like fast pipes into metropolitan areas and different cities. And so you could see a world where most major cities in the world and most minor cities are also all connected via double zero. And the, quite frankly, the last mile connectivity is pretty good. If you are within the New York area, you can talk to any other server within the New York area on very high performance. It's just when you leave a specific metro area and move to another one that you run into a lot of these congestion issues. And so that's kind of the long-term goal for, for Double Zero is to, to be the long-haul transport layer uh, for all types of high-prioritized systems. Building a network that is deeply reliant on hardware and physical infrastructure is very different than the work I've done previously with software networks. And this is where you know, the two other co-founders of Double Zero have years and years of experience building out high performance networks. But we have to deal with things like customs and imports and getting physical connections into things and the quality of a power grid in a particular area and you know, uh, Russian trawlers cutting submarine cables and knocking networks offline and all this stuff that you just don't think about when you're operating purely in the software world. So there's a lot of that stuff that until we have built out 
multiple 100 gigabit networks around the world with multiple independent paths, there's always some fear there that some core component may go offline. Um, and so that's kind of like that, that big component for me. I think the, you know, the, the stuff that's really exciting about this project is the ability to accelerate blockchains and other types of distributed systems by a decade or more and really create an alternative for you know, folks who are looking to compete with big tech to not also have to be building on top of big tech.